This morning we are looking at two parables of Jesus. And before I get too far into it, I'd like to remind us of a description of the parables frequently used by, among others, Michael Harden of Preaching Peace. We are often inclined to look for a point when studying parables, as in, what's the point of this story? The parables are not pointed. They are rounded. In our attempts to understand them, they come around, turn around, as it were, and tell us what we believe about God and our relationship to God and our fellow man. So this morning, I'm going to suggest interpretations, not the only interpretations to be certain, but interpretations that I believe shed some light on the nature of the subject, in the case of both of these parables, the kingdom of God. Listen now as I read the text from Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter, verses 26 to 32. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day. And the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. When the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Before we go any further, I'd like to point out that the kingdom of God, of which the stories speak, is not necessarily to be equated with our Western notion of heaven. For one thing, that concept would have been pretty alien to Jesus' Jewish audience. People who, at least some of them, believed in a resurrection at the end of days, but for the most part, not really in any kind of immediate, conscious, post-death reward. Jesus is also most likely not speaking about the kind of kingdom the world recognizes, one founded on might and power and held together by top-down leadership. The kingdom of God is something else entirely. Perhaps that is the reason it needs to be discussed in terms of parable. It's hard to describe exactly what it is, and perhaps somewhat easier or more meaningful rather to say what it is like. So, in the first of this morning's parables, the kingdom of God is like, or as the text read, is as if a man scattered seed on the ground. So, the man himself is not the kingdom in this parabolic analogy. Neither is the seed, but rather the whole action the whole thing, the spreading, the waiting, the sprouting and growing, and finally the gathering in. This business from sowing all the way to harvesting, that is what the kingdom is like. There are, I suppose, any number of key elements in this story we might focus on. The story intimates that once the seed is scattered, the person doing the scattering has very little to do with it. Although he may sleep and rise day after day, he does not really know how the seed grows. And yet it does, of its own accord. Verse 28 says the earth produces by itself, as if to say the work is done entirely between the seed and the earth, which is its source and destiny. And we know that to be true plant seeds in the ground, and there is a kind of inevitability to it. A plant will soon sprout. 
a plant that will inevitably produce more seeds, and the cycle continues. Until, that is, it doesn't. And we know that to be true as well. We live in a world that appears beset by shortage. Not enough food, not enough water, not enough housing. Bad ground that doesn't always produce what we need. And here you might want to stop me and say, Hey, aren't you a little off track? We were about to discuss a metaphor for God's kingdom, and you seem to be launching into some sort of ecological harangue. My answer would be the two. God's kingdom and ecology are inextricably linked. You see, I believe, along with the United Nations, that there is, in fact, enough fresh water, for example, for all of the Earth's seven billion inhabitants. And what's more, I believe that God does not create a planet that cannot sustain its inhabitants, and that, in fact, scarcity, the understanding that seeds won't sprout enough plants, so to speak, is, in many ways, an illusion. But in its implications, it's a deadly illusion. Or at very least, it is an artificial state of affairs. And it is one that we human beings create and tend to lovingly foster. To borrow once again from the UN, it's not that there are not enough resources. It's that our resources are so unequally distributed. And our management of those resources is most often based on concepts that come from something that is the opposite of the kingdom of God. If the kingdom of God is like the seed being sown and the sprouting so that it may grow and ultimately be harvested, then the kingdom of God does not come to fruition if something interrupts that cycle. And here in our world, our cosmos, as it were, our man-made order, something has interrupted the order. The seeds sprout, it seems, for some and not others. Some have water in abundance, while others die of thirst. Some, and here I have but to look in the mirror to see my own guilt, grow fat in their abundance, while others starve. In this state, there can be no real peace. And if the kingdom of God really is the kingdom of peace, it cannot be achieved while we perpetuate this state of inequality. As long as there is such egregious unevenness, an inequality which seems to be intentionally perpetuated by corporate and national interests, right down to recent discussions of privatizing all water and its distribution, there will never be true peace. There will always be distrust and ultimately war. For wars are fought either to gain something one does not have or to protect what one does have from some real or potential threat of loss. And while we live in this state of no peace, we will continue to create gods in our own image that justify our ways of being. If we are, as most Americans and Europeans seem to be, on the positive side of the equation, if we are the haves, at least for the moment, then we create a God who speaks in patriotic tones, issuing prophecies of American exceptionalism and the inherent superiority of Western European civilization. A God who gives to those who deserve it, those who've earned it, who blesses those 
on whom his favor rests. On the other hand, if we are on the negative side, then we will discover for ourselves a God of seemingly righteous anger, a God who will, it seems, ultimately balance the scales and repay for what has been taken, a God who will teach us to fight and empower us to put our enemies under our feet. And so the haves and the have-nots are united in one thing, in their belief in a God who acts through brigades of soldiers and incendiary bombs. But violence brings no peace. Sure, there may be a moment after a particularly devastating conflict when there is no armed aggression, for the resources have been exhausted. But that is no real peace. In the words of Tacitus, they make a desert and call it peace. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of peace, real peace, both internal, in the heart and in the soul of all humans, and external, no more war, no more societal systems run by greed, it can only be accomplished we are willing to restore that cycle of sowing and allowing to grow. In short, we learn to be in balance with our world. When the decree from Genesis to have dominion over the world it means to be good and equitable stewards, rather than ecological thugs who regularly rape the planet. For true and complete peace, the peace of God's kingdom involves not only a lack of armed conflict, but peace between humans in regards to the planet's resources and peace with the planet itself. As I conclude this portion of this morning's teaching, listen to these familiar words from the 11th chapter of Isaiah as the prophet describes God's kingdom the kingdom of peace. The wolf shall lay down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, even as the waters cover the earth. As we move to the second part of this morning's message, I'd like to consider the second of these two agrarian parables. Here, the kingdom is the seed itself. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Before, the kingdom was likened to an action, a state of existence. It's like the whole business of planting and growing and harvesting. But now in this parable, the kingdom is equated to a thing, the thing that once activated, so to speak, becomes, of its own accord, something very different. We are told the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds and grows into the largest of garden plants. I'm not sure if that is technically true on both counts, but surely to the first century observer, the mustard seed was the smallest seed they had ever seen so small that it is barely visible. And the mustard plant is described as being more like a tree, and so it is. Once again, I believe we are not talking about heaven as we often think of it today. This is not a story about the grandness of the afterlife. 
but rather a story, at least in this interpretation, of what we, together, are to become. What is clear is that the kingdom of God begins as something very small, so small and seemingly insignificant, it cannot readily be seen. One must make a, a conscious effort to see it. The 17th chapter of Luke would remind us that the kingdom of God begins with us, in our midst, among us, and within us. And when it begins, it is often so small that the outer cosmos, the universe of human constructs, neither notices nor cares. The kingdom of God begins when one or two people act upon a decision to forgive or to share what they have, even if they have only a little, or with the decision to forego vengeance, to help instead of harm, to give instead of take, to bless instead of curse. Small, insignificant actions that, if allowed to flourish, will become, little by little, something so much greater. So following the logic of this interpretation, the kingdom will ultimately become larger than anything else around it. And then something else happens. The kingdom, in its magnificent largeness, becomes a place of refuge for, in the story, the birds. So they may carry on their lives, nesting and rearing their young in the comfort and safety of its branches. Please note that the parable makes no mention of these birds being annexed to the kingdom. Obviously, they don't become a part of the tree itself. They remain what they are, what they were intended to be, protected and secured by the tree's strong branches. So, too, I believe that the kingdom of God, however large or small it might be at this juncture, does not exist for its own sake. It does not exist even to perpetuate itself, but rather to be of service to all the creatures, human and even non-human, all the creatures of the world. The kingdom exists so that human beings, and perhaps even the animals of the earth may live at peace with one another. Now, if you were inclined to scoff at these granted somewhat visionary interpretations of these two parables, you probably would have stopped viewing a long time ago. But still, you might say, the kingdom of God is no great plant of many strong branches, and we are so far from Isaiah's holy mountain that peaceable kingdom of artistic description. In fact, if that's really the definition of God's kingdom, a place, a time, a state of peace and equity, where even animals, let alone humans, give up perdition, then it really must be just a mustard seed for where can we even see any of this happening? And you might be right. We may still, we, the citizens of God's kingdom, may still be in the mustard seed stage. But take heart. The signs are everywhere that the old is beginning to pass away. And you'll be pleased, I think, to note that in both parables, the kingdom is intimated as something which is ongoing, a work in divine progress. It will grow. It will sprout, even if we do not fully understand by what agency or mechanics. But right now, today, allow the seed of God's kingdom to be sown in your own heart and soul and life. The treasure, the tiny mustard seed, 
is beginning to grow in your midst for in the fullness of time, God's kingdom shall come.